project. And I do think that at the end, it will be a magnificent area. Somebody said today about outer, the outer London, and I kept thinking, I don't find this outer London. Uh, you can walk here from Notting Hill. You can walk from, you know, any of the, the areas that are considered inner London. I, I think it seems like outer London because it, it seems like a semi-industrial area or has felt like that. But I, I don't think this is London. I think it is outer London. I think it is the continuation of the fabric of London, and I think the right partner will help BBC create uh, the vision they understand is possible and be a catalyst for all of the other people and landowners to fall into something that will be a much bigger vision than maybe anybody had envisaged earlier. You, know, you speak as a creative and imaginative from a uh, developer. What's in it for the BBC to initiate such a process? Because they are the community. I mean, one of the things I found fascinating originally was that people would say, well, you know, I'm not sure, you know, our earlier developers would have a concept that, well, let's cut that out because, you know, we don't have to do that for the community. And finally I said, we are the community. And the BBC is a huge part of this community. They, and the more this becomes a livable community, not just a, a workplace, people will begin to find affordable housing and live here and work here and socialize here and go out to the numerous restaurants that actually don't exist here now, but they will be living here like the, the, fa the fabric of any vibrant city. So BBC benefits from having Absolutely. that social and Absolutely. technological, uh, physical infrastructure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Tim, big opportunity for BBC. Yeah, I think the uh, I think part of it starts today, which is learning from uh, the experiences of other people, and that's hugely important to understand that. Um, and I'm very interested with some of the presentations that we're going on today, also about that sense of lack of boundaries, so understanding actually let's not put too many parameters around this. I think that's part of it. I think it is about having a, a, a real vision for what it is that this is about, what we're trying to achieve. Let's just be, you know, have a, have a, a really big picture, think about that. And also, who's going to be sponsoring this over time? Uh, one of the biggest issues with most big projects that have a, a sort of big vision around it is who's going to sort of see this through from beginning to end? Um, and if that's not going to be the case, then actually how do we have a body of people who are going to be able to carry that torch of, you know, this vision of something absolutely fantastic that we're doing in this area, how's that going to continue over time? So we always want somebody who's, or a group of people who are going to be quite evangelical over, uh, you know, what can be achieved. I think that's, that's hugely important. I think partly understand that it is, some of the elements of the process will be organic. Um, that however much we might plan, program, uh, draft, design, create, that there's going to be an element here that we just aren't going to know and we're going to have to test that as we move forward. Uh, we'll have to work with it and as any good programme or plan goes then we'll need to alter and fine tune as we, as, we, as we go through time. So I think it's partly understanding that it's going to be organic, which is because, and I'm going to come back to that same point, we're involving people. Yeah, that's, that's the point I thought we were going to make that point. Yeah. Uh, and therefore there's going to be an element of unpredictability that comes with that. That's oh. the fun part of these projects. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to predict it as it goes forward completely. But it's a vehicle for cultural change. Absolutely. And I think that's yeah. about understanding um, that also the more we start to engage with people, let's not underestimate how far they will go. Uh, with a lot of creative projects, what we find is that we start out thinking, well, we think we can take people from, you know, from here to here, but actually people are already thinking way beyond that. So once we've sort of tapped into that, that sense of enthusiasm uh, and vibrancy for, for trying to take something forward, then let's not... Uh, underestimate actually how much further that can take us from where we thought initially. Uh, once you start to ask people and engage them, uh, never be surprised at quite how much enthusiasm uh, will come back from it. Okay, generating enthusiasm. Excellent. Simon. You know, I've spent 10 years going around the world looking at these creative clusters, and I have to say that most of them don't work. The experience is that to the extent that they are master planned, to that extent, most creativity tends to get planned out. <laughs> and yeah. However, what that tells us, I think, is that there is a way of going about this. It's been alluded to by many of my colleagues. Mm. 
about agile development, many phase development, temporary uses, find out what works, build reputation, build partnerships, move on, and so on. Um, I think the, the big question that the BBC and the promoters of this project need an answer to is why would creative entrepreneurs, creative companies come here? Um, and the answer to that has got to be in my humble opinion, in, it's quite close to um, Alan Gentov's three C's, actually. I've got three C's. Um, they are customers, collaborators, and cool. And that's why people will come here. They'll, companies will come here to the extent that they can get closer to their customers and sell their services by being here rather than by being anywhere else. They'll come here to the extent that there are other creative individuals, not necessarily like them, but in other parts of the creative field, like biotech or aerospace or whatever, collaborators, if they find those, if they get closer to them here. And they'll come here if it's cool. And it seems to me that the, the BBC, sitting at the centre of this, is, is the key to all of this. It seems to me that a cluster will succeed here to the extent that the BBC itself <coughs> is and provides these kind of incentives. You know, the, the key factor here is not so much the BBC's land, but the BBC as an organisation, as a part of British culture, as a creative producer. That's the key element. That's what's going to draw other businesses here and build reputation. And, you know, for me to wrap this into a a catchphrase. I, for me, the BBC needs to present as the NASA of the British creative economy. Hmm. That's the thing that's going to make this place swell. Up to the moon, right. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, there's a very interesting paradox there, that the BBC could make this a uh, creative place and the BBC could benefit from it being creative and they're woven together in some rather subtle way. They are, in, they are indeed. I mean, they are, of, they are of a piece. Yeah. Um, the BBC's creative energy, to the extent that it flows from the organisation and grows in the outer world, will draw other creative energy to it. Yeah. So, Leonard, you're the professional pessimist, uh, which is why you're here. <laughs> what, what is the big opportunity for the BBC? Well, to, to some extent, uh, this uh, strays beyond my Grief is the pessimist. Um, um, but um, as uh, we're no longer allowed to charge by the word, um, I'll perhaps have, uh, add a few, uh, few what? thoughts. What? Uh, I didn't know that. It's true. It's true. Um, picking up on the point that Simon's just made, I, I think he's absolutely right. Um, uh, I remember coming to the BBC TV Centre as an eight-year-old for my North London primary school to do a television programme which was called Making Music. Many of you here are far too young to, most of you here are far too young to ever remember that. But in a sense, it was uh, an incredibly exciting opportunity and uh, left with me as a sort of lasting memory of the brand of the organisation. And it is about that branding of the BBC and its influence in this location, which I think has the ability to progress this uh, development in a way that uh, others might not have been able to. Um, my firm acts for probably one of the leading advisors to the advertising industry. And uh, that's not just advising uh, on what's honest, decent, legal and truthful, but it's also on where uh, agencies should go. And it was mentioned earlier uh, in one of the presentations about the move into uh, Shoreditch, um, or further into Shoreditch, uh, by a very, uh, very, very cool agency called Mother. Uh, the reason they moved into Shoreditch was actually um, to uh, find a very eclectic building. Um, you know, it was a recreation of the, uh, 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 the tea building. It's where tea used to be stored before it was distributed. And the reason they did that is because it was hip and it was different and it did completely differentiated them. Now, in a sense, if you look out, um, uh, if you look out over the zone, um, there aren't too many particularly hip buildings in the zone that we're talking about. So something else has got to bring this development together. And I think that branding is, of the BBC is absolutely critical <coughs> here. And I think there are two other um, elements that might help. The first is that you've uh, had the presence of, uh, of the government's planning minister here uh, today, and that must be an endorsement 